very warm welcome from the uh, Foundation for Environmental Education. We're very excited to, uh, yeah, to host this webinar and to have our speaker, uh, James O'Hagan, with us uh, to present about uh, mobile journalism. And, but before he starts his presentation, I'm just going to go a few, uh, over a few rules for this meeting. Um, just so you all know, we'll keep, you, uh, keep everyone muted during his presentation. Um, so uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, please write them in the chat and, and we'll collect them and we can have a talk about them after uh, James's um, presentation. So today's topic is, uh, yeah, is mobile journalism and how to be a reporter in the field. Um, and of course, this will be very relevant, especially once the, all our countries are opened up a bit more and you can really go out and do some interviews. Uh, but of course, we, we request that you all please follow the um, national uh, guidelines that you have uh, regulations in your country. So, uh, so keep that in mind and maybe prepare for when you really need to go out in the field. Um, uh, yes, and as I said, there will be time for questions after James's uh, presentation. Um, and if you want to have a diploma of participation, uh, we ask you to please write this in a private chat to uh, Florian Marie. There's a small um, uh, box down in uh, your chat uh, box where you can actually choose Florian Marie and send it directly to her, so your name and your email address if you're interested in a diploma. Uh, after the meeting, we'll send you uh, an email with, uh, with a, a link to SurveyMonkey and we would really like if you would um, participate in that uh, survey about the webinar and uh, we'll actually also have the opportunity to send you some of the notes that uh, and main points of uh, James' this, um, presentation today. Also, the webinar will be recorded and uh, uploaded to our website uh, in case you want to watch it again. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we have uh, another webinar on the 19th of May about uh, wildlife and conservation photography, uh, photography. And you are, of course, also more than welcome to, uh, uh, to participate in that. Uh, and uh, just a little bit about James. I'm sure he will also present himself, but he's a professional journalist and a, a features reporter in your news to Pi Bureau. Um, I, yeah, I actually will uh, let James present himself uh, in order to, uh, to have uh, the most correct uh, information you can have. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, give the floor to James. Okay, thank you very much, Christina. And thank you to all of you for joining me from all over the world again. Uh, it's very exciting to be here and to be given the chance to talk to you. Um, this is the second webinar I've done. So uh, again, I'm not fully used to this medium yet. So bear with me. Um, I'll try to speak slowly. Um, and as Christina mentioned, I've basically written a document with everything that I want to tell you, um, which will then be shared with you. So if you don't understand something, um, or if I speak too quickly, um, you will get a chance to, to read over uh, the topic afterwards. Um, so very quickly to introduce myself. Um, so yes, again, as Christina mentioned, I'm a journalist with Euronews, um, which is Euro Europe's most watched news channel. They'd be happy that I told you that. <laughs> and uh, it, it broadcasts in 12 languages. Um, so maybe even some of your native languages. Um, and I work obviously for the, the English uh, channel. Um, and at the minute I'm working as a reporter in Dubai, but now I'm stuck uh, in Ireland um, because when the lockdown happened, I was here and there were no flights back. So that's why it's not a Dubai background. It's an, it's an Ireland background. Um, and so, yeah, very briefly then, uh, what I will show you is not necessarily academic. Um, I didn't study journalism at school. I studied political science for a master's and then I learned um, to be a reporter really on the job. So beginning in a newsroom, working in a newsroom environment, um, writing scripts and voicing them, so voiceovers um, for television and from there gradually um, working in different departments, so the web department writing web articles and then eventually um, being a reporter, uh, which is what I really always wanted to do. And so what I'm going to do is just run you through some of the things that I learned that I wished someone had told me. Um, 
and I think I'll begin with something that I wanted to cover in the last uh, in the last webinar that I ran out of time with, but it's something that's relevant no matter what medium you choose. So again, what I tell you is based on television, but this is something that's useful whether you're going to do you know radio or whether you're going to be writing a web article or print or anything really. Um, and it's about um, interview tactics and then scripting. Um, so in any medium, you're going to need to do that, most, most probably. Um, so we'll start there. I wanted to begin by talking a little bit about um, interviewees. So you'll notice when you start working as a journalist or as a reporter, many, many people are very happy that you will approach them uh, for an interview. They'll, they'll be very excited that you want to talk to them. Um, which is good, uh, but sometimes they're not necessarily the right person. So the first thing is it's important to decide, is this person that I'm approaching for an interview the right person for my report? Are they really a scientific expert? Do they have uh, the relevant PhD? Maybe are they a published author? Are they well known in their field? If not, are they a reliable eyewitness? So someone who saw an event or uh, if you're talking about the environment, maybe someone like a farmer who's, who's actually seen with their own eyes um, some sort of uh, event uh, as a result of extreme weather, for example. Some, or is it someone with a stake in the story? Um, and normally, whatever interview you do, there will be kind of broadly three types of interviewee. The first one, would, and the most common, is someone with first-hand knowledge, um, so maybe an expert or someone with experience. So that's a witness or a stakeholder. Um, and most of the time, it's someone who has no reason to mislead you. Someone who you've no, you don't need, need to think that they will tell you lies. Um, so they're, you can consider them reliable. That does not mean that you can take what they say at face value. It doesn't mean that everything they say you can put in your report as if it's the truth. You still have to check facts. It's very important um, when you finish the interview to do some fact checking before you include anything that they say in your report because that's your responsibility as the reporter. Um, the second type of interview is more complicated and it's the most difficult. And it's interviews with people who have first-hand knowledge or experience of an event or a subject, but because of their stake in it, they may wish to mislead you or spin the story. So you talk a lot about spin doctors and spin and the angle of a story. And it's that it's not necessarily that they'll tell you a lie. And it's not even necessary. It's not necessary necessarily that you'll be able to fact check what they say, but they might say it in such a way that it makes it seem it, it's, it's kind of dishonest, but there's nothing factually incorrect about it. So these are the interviews that you really have to be careful with and that require the most preparation. And the last type of interview uh, it's often called a vox pop sometimes. It's uh, usually very short, um, short, short interviews for sound bites or sots. And that might be just with a member of the public, um, someone who doesn't have any extra knowledge or expertise. But you use this as a way to include different opinions on a topic. So rather than having, you know, you're going to be talking about the environment. Um, it might be good to have someone who's not an environmentalist, someone who's not a, an expert in uh, biodiversity, just a, a normal um, member of the public to gauge their reaction to the issues that you are um, trying to, uh, to draw their attention to. Um, and that's also the time, it's also a, a time when you can kind of show a variety of perspectives. It's a, an opportunity to give your work um, some balance. So um, let's look at how to approach a difficult interview. Now for any interview, uh, I think a golden rule and a mistake that I certainly made and a lot of people I know make is that they go to the interviewee and they talk and they talk and they talk and they record and they record and they record and there's no focus. The interview is long, it maybe lasts an hour. Now imagine if you've done an hour long interview and you're gonna put it, you're gonna put it in a two minute news piece, a lot of that is wasted time and it might be time that you just simply do not have, especially if it's news, because usually you're turning around a two minute report in one day. So over 
overly long interviews with no focus, that's probably the number one mistake that uh, that people make when they start out. Um, so how do you get around that? Um, what you do is you uh, you basically imagine what you want your interviewee to say before you even meet them, what you need from them. And that will focus your discussion with them and it will help you write a kind of a map. The questions will be like a map. And don't write too many questions. Huh? So write, prepare, let's say, for example, you are going to interview three people for a two minute report. You don't want those interviews to be any longer than 10, 15 minutes. That's really long enough. Um, and you might want to prepare four or five questions that are focused on the, the area of your story that you want them to talk about. Um, and, you know, don't, don't overdo it, basically. That's the first thing. Um, then, uh, although you're prepared, although you know uh, what you want this person to say, there, there will inevitably be things that they say that surprise you. So be ready to improvise as well be ready to ask another question that jumps into your head um, as well be flexible um, one other important thing that people forget to do or a huge mistake a lot of people make with interviews is that especially television if there's a camera pointing at you and a camera pointing at the interviewee journalists sometimes get so and so caught up in how they look and in how they seem that rather than listening person is giving, they're already thinking about the next question. So don't do that. It's very important that you listen to everything they're saying. It is a discussion, essentially. Um, it's saying my internet connection is unstable. Is, there, is, is that okay? Can you still hear me and see me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's um, a little so bit disappointing. Always listen. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm out in the countryside in the mountains, so the internet's not very good. I apologize. Don't worry, um, it's still, so, still working. Still working. So it's all important, it's time, but it's important to what they say. Um, because sometimes it's the most unexpected thing that they say that you haven't thought of becomes the centerpiece of your entire report. So always listen. So now I'm going to give you a few tips. Again, this is all written down. This is all, you'll get this as notes after the webinar. Um, but let's talk about difficult interviews, right? So for difficult interviews, you need to prepare notes in advance that you can use to prove someone wrong if they try to lie to you. Um, so you have to get some statistics from rep reputable sources. Um, maybe anything that's factual, statistical, relevant to the topic that you're talking about and recent have a bank of those ready, have a, have a notebook, even if it's paper or on an iPad, whatever it is, have that, that material easily accessible and you know exactly where it is in advance. So that if, for example, let's say you're talking to a politician, um, let's say it's the Minister for the Environment and you want to know why your country has not met uh, its obligations under the Paris Agreement and they try to throw different information at you to, to take you off the subject, but you have your statistics here and you want them to answer that question. So first of all, have that ready. And then create a logical sequence of questions in a row that you're gonna ask, a kind of like the way a lawyer would when they're cross-examining a witness. So if you watch courtroom dramas and things, it, it's essentially the same, the same skill. You need that politician or that person to admit something. They don't want to admit it. So you have to, you have to engineer your questions to get it out of them. Um, so that requires practice and it requires a lot of preparation and it can be very stressful. It's probably the most stressful type of interview you do, but also the most exciting and the, ones that, the one that will make news and that people will watch and that will have an impact if it's done uh, correctly. So that's important. Then next thing, with those questions, don't go in straight away and ask the most difficult question um, because then they'll immediately be on the defensive. Um, a lot of these people will be trained to deal with difficult interviews. So they'll have someone training them the way I'm trying to train you, telling them exactly how to get around answering the question. So uh, start with easy questions, smile, be relaxed, 
um, you know, try and build a rapport, give them a chance to say all the stuff that they want to say that you probably won't include in your report. And then when they feel nice and relaxed, then gradually, gradually start to bring out the more difficult questions. Gradually, gradually. Don't get uh, flustered. Don't get confrontational. Always stay relaxed. Um, it doesn't, it, I mean, there's different styles of interviews. Some people have an aggressive style. I personally don't find that it works. It comes across better if you're perfectly calm. That's my advice anyway. Then, again, always listening to their answers. Take notes about what they're saying because there might be something that you want to come back to later that they say. So you might want to quote them. You might want to say, well, just a moment ago, you, you mentioned that your government had done everything it could, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case because if you look at this fact that I have pre-prepared, that contradicts what you said in the last question. And that's how you'll then destabilize them and that's how you'll get what you need from them. So in this uh, document that I've prepared that you'll have later, I chose one example that I think is really good from a colleague of mine called Annalise Borges. She's a brilliant reporter. She travels all over the world and does some of the really the best interviews that we get. Um, and one of them was with Nicola, Nicolas Maduro um, in Venezuela, so the, the embattled uh, president of Venezuela. And if you watch that interview now, it's 30 minutes long, but if you watch from about 24 minutes, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. In that interview, uh, so Venezuela, might even have some Venezuelans with us. Um, the country has been in a terrible state for, for many years now. Um, there's kind of, there was almost a coup to throw this president out. But basically, she's focusing on the um, hyperinflation. So the money in Venezuela uh, became pretty much valueless over several years. And it meant that people couldn't afford simple foodstuffs. Um, chicken went from, let's say, costing a few hundred um, in their currency to thousands. So she asked the president about that. He talks about all the wonderful things that he's doing that he wasn't really doing. And she lets him finish the question. And then she, she takes out of her bag a, a stack of money about this size, it was notes and notes and notes, about this much money. And she sits it on the table and she says, do you know how much... Uh, do you know what you can buy with this money today in Venezuela? And he doesn't know. And he tries to get around the question. She said, do you know? And she, she continues to press him. And she said, this much money now today will buy you a chicken. So he can't, he can't get away from that. That's a fact. And he has to then react to it. So it, she really catches him uh, off guard. And it's a really a brilliant uh, interview. So there's just one example. I'm sure there's many in your own countries. And, you know, but that's just one. Um, so, um, I think I've covered that, right? That's difficult interviewing, right? So now, let's imagine that you have all your interviews that you need for your piece, um, and your, all the information that you need, all the statistics, all the interviews are here. What's the next step? So, um, this is the beginning of the scripting process. Now, whether you're doing radio, again, whether it's radio, print, or whatever, it's going to be quite similar. You're going to get all this stuff together, and you're going to have to transcribe it. Now, there's a piece of software called Trint.com. Uh, I'm not saying that you should pay money or you use it. I'm not advocating it. I'm just telling you it because I use it, and it saves me a lot of time. Um, basically, you can take the interview uh, as an MP3 or an MP4 or video file, you can upload it onto one of these websites um, and it will transcribe everything for you. In It's in a lot of languages, not all languages, but I think about 15 languages, 20 languages. In English, it works brilliantly. In French, it works brilliantly. And what it does is then it transcribes the interview for you. You go through and check that it's correct. You know, you, there'll be some mistakes. It's not perfect. Um, and then what's brilliant about it is you can then highlight the parts that you want to use in your report and it will tell you the exact duration. So if it's 15 seconds or 30 seconds, it will tell you based on what you highlighted, the exact duration of the sound bite that you want. And then you can export it as what's called an EDL, a .EDL, which can then be put into your editing software and will automatically cut uh, exactly the pieces that you want. Now that in itself has saved me days because 
a 30 minute transcription of an interview will take, it takes a long time. I'm not a great type, I'm not a great typist. Um, it takes hours. And then deciding which bits and how long is that sound bite and oh, it, it's a long, it takes a long, long time. That can save you days of work. Software like that, Trint.com um, is just an example. So you've gone through your interviews, they're all transcribed whether manually or using one of these pieces of software, you know you're going to have too much. You're going to have too much for your report. You just will. So this is the, this is the kind of hard part. You've taken all these sound bites, and now you need to create the story in your head, and you need to link them together. So I pull all the sound bites together, and I put them in a logical order. Um, and then I start to... Uh, I start to write my script. So, um, oh, I can hear someone there. So, uh, there are several ways to do that. Uh, VOs or voiceovers in television is an important tool for linking sound bites together. So, uh, the structure that I normally use, that most television reporters use, um, you begin with what's known as a top line. Uh, all journalists, whether print or television, are taught to summarize the most important information in your report in the first line, the very first line. So explain what, what this report's going to talk about and why it's important in the very first line. And if you look at almost any, um, I'll share my screen and show you an example, actually. Uh, if you look at almost any um, newspaper you'll see this, so I'm gonna share my screen. I think I chose this last week, so it's actually a, a slightly older piece, but even in print, so here we do see. Let, let's look at this. This is from The Guardian, which is an ecological story, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Now this is also, it's a great uh, skill to have, to be able to summarize something in one line is very, very useful, because sometimes in a newsroom, uh, you'll pitch a story to an editor, you know, and the editor's busy, and stories they're thinking about, journalists everywhere, phones ringing, ah, and you say, excuse me, can I pitch a story? What is it? And they'll say, what's your top line? And that means they want you to tell your story in one sense. So look at it yourself at home or when you're reading the newspaper. Like, for example, here, the headline obviously is important. That's what gets the, the your audience to click on it. Why Britain's 2.5 billion paper coffee cups are an e-blaster. So again, in terms of uh, Google optimization, um, that's, it's not quite sure. So a good headline, we want you, want you to make you want to click. And first line, Britain gets through 2.5, and the number is set to increase. Now again, this is two, two sentences technically, but, you know, but despite a growing clamor for coffee chains are used only once, which critics say is a considerable. James, well, sorry, I, the internet is, is crashing a little bit. Um, I don't know, maybe it's because of the screen sharing, but the, yeah, at least I'm having some trouble hearing you. Oh, I think maybe we lost him. No, let's see. Did you lose me there? Oh yeah, no, you're back now. <laughs> I'm back, sorry, this internet's terrible. I don't know where you lost me, but basically I was just reading the top line um, of a Guardian article. I won't share the screen in case that's what's done this. But basically within 15 seconds of reading this article, I know what it's about, the latest information, and it gives me something that will encourage me to read on. And in television, it's exactly the same thing. Um, and how do we do that? We do it usually with what's called a piece to camera, where you see the journalist speaking, or with a VO. So in TV, that's your top line. Um, so uh, again, you'll notice this when you're reading newspapers now, the, everything's kind of, some, that top line, you'll see it again and again. So pieces to camera. Um, what's good practice in a piece to camera? Um, again, I've got examples that you can watch after if you'd like, um, but it's good practice if you're a reporter in front of the camera to have a reason to be there. 
some reporters want to be on TV so much that they do pieces to camera that there's there's absolutely no point in them being there. So decide if you need to be seen or if it's better to allow your subject to be the star of the show. And oftentimes it's better, especially if you're talking about the environment. You know, if I'm doing a piece about the environment, I'm not going to have myself in the piece for two minutes, you know, when it's a four minute piece. I might do 10 seconds if there's a reason, but I want the environment to be the star of the show, not me. So that's the first tip is if you're doing a piece to camera, have a good reason for it. Usually it's because you want to show the viewer something um, to draw them in. That's fine. Maybe it's because there's an activity that you can do as a reporter, which the viewer can relate to. They can say, oh, that's, that looks, oh, wow. You know, and, and they can live kind of vicariously through you. That's a, that's a good reason to do one. Um, but otherwise, a voiceover is a perfectly, uh, a perfectly good way to open up a, a report. Um, I've given an example of a good piece of camera that I did, did, which is really probably not a good thing to do. But anyway, you can have a look inside for yourself. Um, so voiceovers. Um, for voiceovers then, same idea as the print article. Sum up what you're going to be talking about, why it's important and pertinent in the first line. Um, and don't overwrite your VO. Let the people you've interviewed tell this story. Your VO is just a way to draw the viewer in and then navigate between the the interviews that you've already conducted, and also to give important context. So research that you've done about figures, for example, that's not very visual, um, that you don't want to show as a graph on the screen, then you might want to use a VO for that. Um, also, VOs can be useful. Sometimes if you're, this is important actually, sometimes if you're interviewing scientific experts, they are so clever that they will speak in language that no one understands except scientists. So your job is to understand it as much as you can and then distill it, break it down into layman's terms. So always try and get your experts. If, if you think it's not something that people won't understand, don't be afraid to stop your interview and say, listen, that, that is exactly what I want you to say, but can you simplify that a little bit? Can you give an example, a concrete example, to help the viewers know what you're actually talking about? Um, so that's a that's an important that's an important point. If they can't do that, I think it's your job to kind of simplify it in a VO and maybe use a graphic uh, to illustrate that. So that's your VOs. You're then using them to weave the story between your sound bites, between the sections of interview that you have chosen. Good practice is writing what they call punchy VOs. Punchy meaning short. Uh, so, you know, your introduction might be 10 seconds and then you might just link your, uh, link your sound bites together with five second VO, literally five seconds. That's fine. Never write 30 seconds of voiceover uh, unless you're making an hour long program, but in a report, it's not, it's, it's not good practice to write very long VOs. We want to hear what people have to say. We don't want to hear some disembodied voice speaking over some strange images. Um, so I've given an example um, of this in the, in the document. So this is a, there's a series at the minute called Unreported Europe. And the reason I've chosen this to show you um, is because it's all done on a mobile phone. It's one journalist, sometimes one journalist and one producer but only ever on a mobile phone. So this is a kind of this yourself with your mobile phone. Um, most people have ones that are actually broadcast quality these days. The latest uh, Samsungs and iPhones and things like that, they all shoot in HD, sometimes in 4K. So they're, they're, they're the equivalent of an enormous TV camera 15 years ago. So that, that power at your fingertips is fantastic. So now I'll go on to talk a little bit more about how you shoot these things. So. Um, that's your scripting basically. Let me just finish one point on scripting. So you've written your script, you've got your sound bites, it's all making sense. And then the last thing you do is you write a payoff. A payoff is a voiceover or the piece to camera in which you kind of summarize everything and leave your audience with something to think about. Um, journalists don't tend to give their opinion. Um, so what we tend to do is ask a question or uh, point to something that you've already shown 
um, that you want the audience to think about. Um, so that's an important way to finish your script. So let's leave that at script. I'm at third, okay, we can do this. So um, I'm now gonna give you some tips about filming um, an interview. This is really if you're gonna do filming, if you're gonna do print, this isn't necessarily gonna help you, but it, it should be interesting anyway. So uh, I'm gonna imagine that you're gonna film interviews and you only have one phone and one tripod and you're on your own. And how do you do it? Right, the first thing is, you're going to need what are called cutaways. Cutaways are shots you use to cut your interview down. So you've done a 10 minute interview, but you want it to last 30 seconds. You need other footage to cut to, so that it doesn't show me jumping. It's like, oh, he's not moving around in the frame so that it's smooth and seamless. So what is a cutaway? A cutaway can be done after the interview. So you do the interview, ask all the questions, you have the camera pointed at your interviewee, you frame it nicely. Um, I'm not gonna go into that because I'm not a cameraman, but there are rules about thirds and there are ways to do it properly. And um, you'll get better and better at it as you go along. Frame your interviewee nicely, conduct the interview, that's all recorded. Then um, ask the interviewee to remain seated and then just shoot some other things in the room where you don't see their face. So maybe their hands, maybe, uh, if they show you something, if they're holding a, something that they want to show you, close-ups of that, close-ups of um, just certain things in the room that you can cut to um, when you make a cut in the edit. So that's a, that's a cutaway. Then if you want to include your questions and you only have one camera, we do a thing called uh, a reverse, reverses or noddies, noddies to nod. So uh, this might disappoint some of you, but we do it after the interview, and sometimes the interviewee isn't actually there. So I'll be sitting, the interviewee's gone, he's busy, he's left. I sit in the same chair, and I look at where he or she was, and I go like this. But they're not actually there. <laughs> and that's called a noddy. And a reverse is the same thing, but you ask the question. So all the questions I asked during the real interview, I asked them again to no one but I make sure that my eye line is roughly where they were. So you set the camera up again, point it towards yourself, ask the questions that you asked, imagining that the interviewee is there, and then do several seconds of nodding, right? And then you can use all of that stuff to edit your interview together so that it looks really nice, it looks professional, um, and you have enough material. Um, so now, B-roll, the next thing, um, B-roll, is really important in any report. B-roll is like, if you imagine, say, imagine that your report is a, is a painting. Um, your interview is the sketch. Your, your interview is the material, the subject, everything's sketched out, but your B-roll is like the paint. So the B-roll is what takes it from black and white to full color. So it's illustrative footage, um, and we do call it painting. So once you've got your report down, once you've got, usually we think about sound first. So we have a four minute report. The piece to camera opening, welcome down here at the blah, blah, blah. Here we go, we're gonna meet this person. Interviewee, next interviewee, voiceover, interviewee, voiceover, payoff, four minutes long. It's the right duration. I, I am happy with the content. I've fact checked everything. I know that statistics are good. Now I can start painting it. And this is when the B-roll comes in. So it's everything else that you film to tell the story. So when your interviewee is talking about um, soil erosion, you need lots of lovely shots or not so lovely shots of, uh, that illustrate soil erosion. So that's usually something that you will do when you're on location in various places talking to your, your subjects. But it's important to ask, uh, if you're talking to an organization, most of them will have lots and lots and lots of material that they want you to use that's already filmed. And that can save you so much time and effort. So always ask, do you have any B-roll? Do you have any B-roll? Can I take some B-roll? Um, and make sure that you have permission to use it. Make sure, usually in an email, just say, can you confirm that I have permission to use your B-roll? And they say, yes, and usually that's enough. So then that's used to kind of uh, just say, you don't just want cutaways and the journalist asking questions and another person speaking and me speaking and you speaking and he speaking. It gets very boring. So you use this to let your piece breathe and kind of bring it to life. Um, 
So that's B roll. So now we've talked about we've talked about interview techniques. We've talked about uh, what else do we talk about? interview techniques, transcribing and scripting, voiceovers, uh, cutaways, reverses, naughties, and B roll. That's already a lot. <laughs> but now I'm going to talk a little bit before. What time is it? Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about live mobile reporting. So this is something I've had some experience of recently. I hadn't done it until recently. Uh, and it's kind of the most nerve wracking thing for a reporter is when they're live because anything can go wrong. Um, but anything can also go right. So um, a few years ago, if you watched a reporter on the news and they were live, that was costing a lot of money because there would have been a satellite truck with, you know, there would have been a sound engineer, there would have been a camera operator, there would have been all kinds of people behind the scenes making it happen. Now, most of the time, it's one journalist, one mobile phone, a tripod, a microphone. And there might be a light on top of the mobile phone. That's it. That's all they have. That's all they need. Um, so I'm going to walk through how that works. Uh, and I'll share the screen at the end just to show you the software that I'm talking about. So how does it work? Uh, so the equipment you need is smartphone. Um, most smartphones, sort of recent, would be fine. A tripod that you can put the smartphone onto. Um, a microphone that connects to your smartphone. So usually there'll be a microphone with a USB connection on it. Um, an app. So the app that we use in the industry is called Live U. Um, there are probably others. I don't know. Um, and you need a second mobile phone, uh, which is only so you can hear what the studio is saying to you. Um, so you need headphones to plug that second phone in. That's it. That's all you need. So what do you do? Right. You plug in your microphone. You set up your, your mobile phone on the tripod. You make sure you've got a nice frame. You can see something interesting behind you, whatever. You turn on live view. Um, and again, this in your case, you might want to use Facebook Live. If it might be Instagram Live, it might be something slightly different. The principle is the same. So you've got a nice frame. You're on your app. I'll actually show you the app. I'm afraid in case this goes off, I'll show it to you at the end. Um, you frame yourself up. You test your sound. Um, usually there'll be a there'll be a graph that shows you your voice, what, what the sound, and it'll go yellow. It'll go uh, green, yellow, red. If it's red, it's too loud, so turn your volume down. And if it's green, it's good. That's usually a universal color language. Um, so then you use your second mobile phone and you have a number that the studio will give you. It's called an IFB. Um, so it's a special telephone line where I call and I can hear lots of different people um, who I need to hear. I put that in my pocket and I bring the, the headphones into my ear so it looks good it's not in the way it's kind of hidden so now i can hear the television show that i'm on so i can hear the presenter the music whatever and i can also hear the producer and so the producer will tell me okay you're live in five minutes your first question is this your second question is this so you'll sit there you'll prepare you're nervous but you try and calm yourself down you think of all the things you need to say you check your facts whatever you get ready and then the the producer will say, live in 10 seconds. And so you look at your phone, straight, straight down, straight up the lens like that. Yeah. And that's it. You do it. They ask you a question, you answer. You don't see yourself. You don't see anyone. You're just looking at a phone. Um, it's only after that you get to watch it back. Um, and that's how you do a live using a mobile phone. Um, I'll show you the app that I'm talking about after. Uh, I'm looking at the time. Okay. So now I'm going to give you just a few. This is the last thing. Um, I'm going to give you a few different examples of how you can do a live using a mobile phone. I'm going to tell you about the terminology that we use. So the first one is uh, down the line, it's called, down the line. Um, and that is where you do the same thing we just discussed, but the journalist isn't on screen. The, you have a guest that you've found and you set them up and the presenter in the studio will ask the guest directly the questions. So you give the guest the earpiece you do. The, the guest does everything you would do but you're just not on screen. Um, and that's called down the line. The next one is the most complicated. It's called a donut. I do not know why it's called a donut. 
Uh, if anyone has any ideas, message the, on a postcard. No, you can write it in the group chat. So this is whenever um, the presenter asks the reporter a question live. The reporter answers the question, and in the middle of their answer, they, they throw to a piece that they recorded earlier in the day. So for example, you could say, you know, if it was about this COVID-19 um, pandemic, I would give, I could give the latest, well, the latest statistics in the UK are that it's overtaken, um, it's overtaken Italy and it's now the country with the highest mortality rate. A little bit earlier, I spoke to the Minister of Health, blah, 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 and this is what he had to say. So that's me throwing to a video that the studio will play and then I can hear it. And when I know what the last word of it is, so when the last word of the pre-recorded video plays, then I come back um, and I conclude. So I say, well, as you heard, she thinks that it's going to take at least another blah, 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 three weeks of lockdown, blah, 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 whatever it is, you conclude. And then you throw back to the presenter. So you, if the presenter's called Rose, you'll say, Rose. <laughs> or back to you in the studio, Rose. You, you need to make that clear because otherwise you could end up standing there on TV, not knowing if you're on TV or not, uh, not knowing whether to speak. So always cue uh, the studio well. That's called a donut. And the last one is called, a, so this is when um, the presenter uh, comes to the reporter, asks the reporter a question. Reporter answers the question and says, I'm joined by blah, blah, blah. Out of frame, bring them in. So it's two of you. Uh, and you ask them questions with the microphone like this. Important, never give an interviewee the last word. It's not their job. You take the microphone and you conclude and you throw back to the studio. That's important. Uh, and that's all the different ways um, that I can think of to tell you about uh, mobile reporting and using lives. Um, again, it's all written down here. With some Examples. Um, I'm just going to show you the piece of software now. James, uh, you're already uh, breaking a little bit, um, so I'm not sure if it will work. Um, uh, uh, but uh, I, if you want, you can maybe share a link uh, in the chat. Hello? Yes. Are you talking yes. to me, Christina? <laughs> yes, I was. I was just saying that you were breaking up a little bit. Um, and then I'm a little afraid that if you share your screen, you uh -huh. might disappear completely. But um, maybe you can um, okay. share um, a link, maybe, if there's if, if that's possible in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, I just want to share my screen, actually, because um, then we can have some time for some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so I'm just going to show this. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, also Florian, no, let me see here. All right, perfect. Um, so what I would like you to do, everyone who's here, is to go on your phone maybe or on your um, uh, computer uh, and type in www.menti.com. And then you can use the screen uh, up in the corner, uh, 2424, last one, uh, 60. Uh, and then you are actually able to, um, to ask some questions directly to, uh, to James, uh, or if you have any comments. Um, I actually noticed one of the questions in the chat was if you have a Twitter, James. So maybe uh, somebody are interested in, in following your work, uh, you're also free to, to share that. Um, Oh yeah, do you have social media? <laughs> uh, I'm oh, sorry, I think you're breaking up again. Just a few more about Yeah, I think it's breaking, James. Can you hear us?
No, we lost him. Yeah, yeah, maybe turning off the, the, the camera will uh, will make a difference. I'll do the same. I'll turn off the camera. Stop video. Stop video. Okay. You didn't need to see me anyway. Yeah, it's better now. We can hear you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Better All off right. listening to me anyway. Uh, yeah, James, so, so a couple of uh, questions. Well, also some comments that they really like the, the, the information. Um, but of course, if you want to share any of your social media, or uh, then you can also do it in chat. DMs. Um, all right. Uh, anyone with questions? Uh, I mean, we've covered a lot of things from interviews, voiceovers, script uh, writing, headlines, filming. So uh, feel free to to take this opportunity to actually ask some some questions if you if you have any. Um. Yeah, happy to try and answer questions if I can. Uh, again, this was just an overview. I tried to tell you everything I know in an hour, which is probably not a good thing to do. But <laughs> uh, James, maybe actually one thing that I thought of when you talked about um, uh, doing interviews in the field, and um, something that uh, actually I noticed with the with our uh, young reporters, for example, when they go to conferences. It's very hard to find a, a spot that's very quiet because, um, yeah, um, it becomes very disturbing if there's background noise or people walking by. Do you have any good tips for this? So this is the bane of report existence all over the world. This is the most annoying thing for anyone, especially if it's a busy event with lots of people. Um, it's almost impossible to get good sound unless you have a really good microphone. Um, so all you can do is try your best to find a quiet spot, um, arrange to meet the person somewhere slightly outside of the event. Um, but it is just a problem for everyone. Um, it's usually events are usually the best place to meet people to interview later at a carefully chosen location that's quiet. <laughs> That's all I can. That's all I can say. Um, and choose your microphone wisely. Yeah, can you that's hear? a good point. <laughs> so, for example, um, you know, lapel mics, the mics that clip on to your um, to your lapel on your jacket, they tend to be directional. Um, you can also have a boom as a backup, which is the big microphones with a stick. But again, you're talking about money here. This isn't necessarily for someone doing it just on their phone. But yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a very important point. It's just, it's just difficult with sound. But with news, you get away with bad sound. Not bad sound, but with poorer sound. You know. Can we keep your contact in touch later? Uh, yes, you can keep my contact. Uh, they can share it with you, my email. I'll put my email address here if you want. Should I do that? If you want to. <laughs> I have social media, but I don't really use it very much. Uh, I should, but I don't. I, my stuff goes on to your own uses social media. So then I don't bother putting it on mine, which is, again, probably not good practice. But there's my email address. And yeah, and one is, I see one is asking about the, the tips for mobile journalism. Uh, this will be shared in the, in the email that we'll be sending uh, to participants after the webinar. Uh, so you'll, you'll give it. Jackson, to this. Oh, there's somebody asking about night shooting. Oh, night shooting. Oh, <laughs> uh, on a mobile phone. So, uh, right. So one of the limitations with the mobile phone, there are a few. Um, one of them is zooming. Very few mobile phones have a good zoom on them. I think the latest ones, maybe they do, but you talk, they're very expensive. So you can't really zoom. And the other thing is the sensors are not very good at night. Um, so you need to have good lights, good lights. It's the only way to shoot something at night, unless you have night vision mode on your phone, um, then that's possible. Um, but it is one of the limitations of mobile journalism. You, you sort of need good light most of the time. Yeah. 
and you can't zoom in very well. All right, so um, I just want to repeat that. Uh, oh, there is another question here, but if, yeah, if you want to pose a question, you can go to menti.com and use the code uh, 242460. Um, but uh, there's a question of how would you convince someone to do an interview if they say they don't have time or they say they are busy at a conference? Thank you. Um, so, uh, this happened to you a lot. It, it's inevitable. People re refuse interviews, especially when they think it's not in their interest. Um, usually, if you work for a reputable newspaper or t TV channel, it becomes less of an issue because people want to have a chance to be on your uh, platform. Um, but if they don't, then one thing that we do is say, okay, well, I will just inform you that I will be forced to, to say that you were not uh, available for comment. And at least you can include. Um, so that's a threat that we use. It's not really a threat. It's like, you know, if you don't give us some comment, then we will say that you didn't have a comment. And then it looks bad in your piece because it looks like they didn't have anything to say when they probably should have. If this is more, if it's a confrontational type interview, if it's just an expert who's someone who's very busy, you will have people who just say no. You just try to be nice to them and to convince them. That's part of the job of a producer as well. And there are people in news organizations called bookers, and their job is to book people. And they're very persuasive and very charming, usually. Um, so all I can say is be charming, be flexible, um, explain to them why it's important that this uh, topic be spoken about and why they are the perfect person to, to comment. Flattery is good. Um, Maybe I... Not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, sorry, I just also wanted to add that also you can introduce yourself as a young reporter for the environment and, and tell a little bit about what, why this is important and, and hopefully also that way uh, convince them to take part. Yeah, exactly. Use young reporters for the environment as your kind of, your trampoline. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all I can say. I'll try and persuade them, be flexible. And if it's not this time, ask, could, could you maybe set up a date later in the month? And, you know, push it back, uh, try and get them another time, you know, be as flexible and as, as accommodating as you can. Yeah, thank you. And uh, there's also a, a question about stuttering. Do you have any uh, recommendations to how to avoid that? Stuttering. Um, so obviously some people have, it's a real condition uh, and I'm not sure how to, how to avoid it if you have the, really the medical condition of, of stuttering. Um, when it comes to speaking live, uh, again, even things like uh, 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 I do do it, but what you're taught is that when you finish a sentence, you bite your tongue or you, 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 know, you kind of do something that will make you conscious of the sounds coming out of your, out of your mouth. So when you finish a sentence, maybe you clench your toes. And when you start your next sentence, unclench your toes. And when you finish the sentence, clench your toes. And every time you clench your toes, no sound is coming out of your mouth. That's one, that's one tip that I was taught. Clench your toes. <laughs> Super. <laughs> I think uh, Florian maybe also have some questions from the chat. Yeah, there was a question from Chad. Uh, James, would it be a good advice to use two mobile phones and using one to record only the sound and after using that sound to edit the interview, adding it to the shooting? To the shooting? Um, yes, if you have two mobile phones, yes. Or even better is you use your one mobile phone and have a Zoom or a, a recording device separately. And what that does is it means that you have a backup sound. It means you have your sound twice. You'll have the sound recorded on, the, on your mobile phone and you'll have it again, probably better quality on a, on a recording device. So if you can afford to have it, yes, that's a, that's a good thing to do. Quite great. I think I'm really gonna go ahead with this, uh, another question. Um, just to hear a little bit from you, uh, again, if you can uh, go to Menti and you can uh, answer the question, how do you prepare for going into the field as a reporter and doing an interview? So from what we talked about so far, uh, what will you, um, how will you prepare? And you don't have to cover everything, you can just say one thing that you will remember. 
prepare questions before interviewing. Yes, that's a good one. Choosing the right person to interview. Oh, yeah, that's the wrong one. James, do you see the answers as well? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. If you have any comments to any of them, please. Uh, no, no, I, I was just writing down notes. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> notes myself. I get the fact. I suppose that it refers to kind of, uh, yeah, checking up on the facts and doing some research before actually doing the interview. And yeah, that's one of investigation, being sure of the, uh, the interview questions. Perfect. Someone is also mentioning on chat, get the fact about the person you're interviewing. It can be also good. Yes, definitely. So uh, who are she or she working for? Or what are they doing? Um, Maybe if they've been in, in other articles, maybe you can find some information about, about them. So that's a good point as well. Oh, somebody is saying comfortable shoes. That's probably also a good, uh, good tip. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one other thing there on clothes, it is important. Uh, one time I went out and I didn't have a pocket on a belt and I couldn't attach my microphone. It was a big, big problem. Uh, <laughs> also, uh, sometimes certain clothes um, on camera, they they just turn weird. The like if there's lots of little dots on camera, it just goes bizarre for some reason. Um, that's another one. Avoid polka dots. Right. So uh, one one color uh, <laughs> um, shirt maybe. Um, perfect. It seems like you you all stripes. Yeah, stripes. To avoid yeah. stripes. Uh, mm -hmm. Stripes that are close together. It's the same thing. Francesca is right. Super, and yeah, and also finding a place that's uh, without noise and um, yeah, that's, that's also important. So this is something I didn't talk about actually, it just reminded me. Um, one of the processes is a recce, so a reconnaissance. So usually before an important interview, you'll go to the place, make sure it's not too loud, make sure it's not too bright, um, just make sure it's a suitable place, um, test the equipment, look at the camera, see if, the, if it's overexposed, for example, if, the, if it's too bright um, and just find solutions ahead of time. Yeah, perfect. Okay, I'm gonna go to one more question. We only have two more, so uh, don't worry. Uh, what journalistic devices um, do you always bring with you when going into the field? And you can choose uh, multiple if you want to. I'm putting paper and pen because I'm old. <laughs> Have you not got a, a group called Old Reporters for the Impact? <laughs> we, uh, we have considered uh, making that because a lot of the, uh, well, this program was founded uh, 25 years ago. So all of our young reporters are, are getting older. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so mobile phone is definitely on the, on the high end. Um, And um, one thing as well, just it reminded me, uh, again, it's just some practical advice. Um, I usually write all my notes up on a Google Doc, um, and then I have them on my mobile phone, um, and I can share them easily if something goes wrong. You know, I can easily share them with another journalist to replace me. They won't get lost, um, and I can, I can change them and adapt them in real time, and other people can see them. If I'm editing remotely, so at the minute I'm in Ireland, but my editor, my video editor is in Dubai, I can write an entire script for him on a Google Doc, change it, and he sees it in real time and edits in real time with me across the world. Yeah, that, that's actually really good advice also for if you're doing a, a piece for a, with, within interla international collaboration, because we really, uh, it's fantastic to have students collaborate um, across borders. Uh, so if you're in two different countries, uh, that's a good uh, tip also for, uh, for you students uh, to work together if you do it on a... a Google Drive. Yeah. Uh, I see not so much, well, not so many bring uh, a tripod. And maybe also I just want to highlight this one because it's, uh, it's a good way to actually get some steady images um, uh, and make sure that it's not uh, too wavy, your, your footage. Um, but it's fantastic that, uh, yeah. 
Um, all right. Uh, your main takeaway from this webinar. And now, yeah, we're we're almost done. We have uh, a few more minutes, uh, and then we'll close down. But we we'll really like to hear uh, what the main um, ideas that you'll take away from this. <laughs> Somebody will remember your name, James. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's also a comment of always being prepared and confident for an interview. That's definitely right. And editing, also some tips about that. That's good. <laughs> fail to prepare, prepare to fail. I'm, I'm not sure about that one, but... <laughs> um, Definitely try not to fail, but do your best to, uh, um, yeah, to uh, to prepare yourself for the for the interviews and uh, uh, and the report that you're doing. Strategies for difficult interviews. That's also great that you took that away. All right, great. We're running out of time, so I'm just going to take this very last uh, question and, and then we'll be uh, over. Um, just while this is um, running, I just want to say uh, a lot of thank you to James that you've been on now uh, twice for uh, Young Reporters with the Environment. Um, it's really inspiring to hear from a professional journalist and get some tips on how we can also uh, improve the work um, from our perspective on the wiry. Um, well, thank you for having me. It was my pleasure to participate. I hope it was useful and you enjoyed it. And see you again. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's it. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, yeah, hope to see you again on the 19th of May where we'll have a webinar about um, uh, uh, wild, uh, what's it called? Wildlife photography and conservation, conservation. photography. <laughs> exactly. So, so hope to see you then. And uh, yeah, take care, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Jen. <laughs>